Well, thank you everybody for attending the 61st Global Legal Confex. I'm happy to be here presenting to you on the CCPA and the current developments that are in progress today. Uh, this presentation is called CCPA Now in Effect, Where Are You? And also we will talk about not only where you are as an organization, but also where the CCPA is. So a little bit of a legal disclaimer here, uh, just as if with any legal focused webinar, um, it's we're talking about issues of a general nature and anything that you may have specifically addressing your organization should be directed either to your in-house legal counsel or also to any attorneys that you may utilize as external sources. The agenda for today is to go over how we got here, the purpose of the CCPA, how to build a CCPA compliance framework, and the future of the CCPA, which this has a little bit of an allusion to, how it's transitioning into the CPRA as a result of the election that occurred on November 3rd. So how we got here. So this really developed, the CCPA came into, into purview as a result of the Facebook Cambridge Analytica data scandal, which primarily occurred in the years of 2015 and 2016. Uh, there's some time before and time after, but mainly focused around those two years, in particular the 2016 election in the United States. This was really based on an app on Facebook that collected data on Facebook users and not only themselves, but also their friends and contacts that they may have connected with on Facebook. They sold this data to a third party, and then therefore Cambridge Analytica then utilized this data for marketing sales and for providing other awareness to people's emails and, and other ways to connect out to them through Facebook. As a result of this, there was significant concern in the legal community as well as, as the privacy advocate community. And it really led to the development of the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018. Now, one of the interesting pieces of the California Consumer Privacy Act is that it was to avoid having the CCPA put on a ballot initiative, which then was avoided in 2018, but was not avoided in 2020, as, as we will get into further later. The CCPA was signed into law in June 2018, went into effect as of January 1st, but became fully enforceable as of July 1st of 2020. And, and one of the reasons I call out the enforcement date is that that's, uh, as all of these are now in the past, that was the critical date in which the Attorney General of the state of California started enforcing any violations of the law. So there was that six month grace period from when it went into effect to when it became enforceable. But both of those, the effect uh, period has now passed. So uh, one of the mad, you know, maddening and, and problematic pieces of this legislation is that while the law was placed into law in June of 2018, there have been many subsequent amendments to the provisions which occurred on September of 2018, October of 2019, and September of 2020. Further revisions are also being considered, which is what makes this for a nightmare for companies to comply because of the fact that this is an ever-changing legislation and the fact that many of these provisions are always moving targets and creating a framework to be able to handle the moving target is always more complicated than, for example, the GDPR, which had some significant clarity prior to its May 2018 enforcement date, enactment date, versus the CCPA, which, which has legislation in progress while it's in effect and while it's enforceable. One of the important things to note is the threshold for which this applies to businesses. Um, it currently exists at over $25 million in gross revenue overall greater than 50% of its revenue coming from California residents and the sale of their information, or you, you distribute, process, or receive data from more than 50,000 Californians annually. Now, it also, you know, it's important to note that as of November 3rd, the California Privacy Rights Act went into, was passed on the, as Proposition 24 on the California ballot with approximately 56% of the voters approving the measure. This will become effective on January 1st, 2023. So while there's plenty of time to comply, the time to start planning for the compliance of it is, is now. Um, and again, we expect this to follow the similar path as the California Consumer Privacy Act, and that there will likely be legislation that will occur in 2021 with further amendments for the subsequent years thereafter. Hopefully the this will be avoided and that there won't be amendments following January 1st, 2023. And hopefully we will see 
most amendments in place by January 1st, 2022, so that to allow companies to provide an, an opportunity to ensure their compliance. So now we'll go into the purpose of the CCPA. The purpose is to give consumers more control of their personal information. Again, going back to Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, one of the, the things that was discovered and concerning is the lack of understanding people had as to where their personal information may go without their knowledge. This really is delineated in four rights. The right to know, the right to delete, the right to opt out, and the right to be not be discriminated against for exercising your legal rights. So these are these four pieces form the tenant of the regulation and always should be in mind whenever working through any potential uh, framework or architecture for the compliance policies and procedures. Because these it, as these are the four tenants of the law, these are likely the areas where the um, enforcement agency, which now is the attorney general, which will subsequently change in 2023, which will go over further, but they'll, they'll still be focused on these four areas. Again, also, it's important to understand what's covered by the regulation, which is personal information. So similar to GDPR, it's not the standard of health information or a particular type of information, but it's the broad, the broad bucket. And rather than outlining them here and going through them verbally, I've, I've provided a, a little bit of a understanding as to what is captured. And this is directly off of the state of California's website. So this is where they will be looking. And the key areas to note are internet browsing history, geolocation data, and then inferences that may be created because those are more expansive than how we typically have addressed these types of information in the past prior to the CCPA going into effect. So here's probably the, 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 the most helpful pieces of, of this presentation. It's how to build a CCPA compliance framework. So this is uh, one of the things I always understand here is um, there is a little bit of privacy fatigue and, and that needs to be worked through through your organization, especially for those that have global organizations that may have already spent multiple years and multiple, uh, you know, the heads on, on creating a GDPR type framework. Um, so, so one of the things that, that we've run into at Boston Scientific is people uh, are, are concerned that all of a sudden now they're being asked to do another work effort. So that, that is something that is real and, and, and that needs to be overcome at the organization. And, and while it's not substantive in the, in the law itself, is something to, to have an awareness to and a sensitivity to um, because that'll help you become more effective in, in setting up your compliance framework for the CCPA. Um, what the first piece is to know and understand your data collection and usage practices. So first, you kind of need to know where your marketing teams and your sales teams and any other teams that may be collecting information on, on any users and consumers in California may be collecting the data. And one of the most important pieces to understand is your so company's social media marketing policy on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. How are they utilizing and how are they collecting data of those people that they engage with? What are they doing with the data? Is it going to any third parties? And building up and ensuring that you have full visibility and understanding as of the practices. Many of these social media platforms following the enactment of the CCPA have established ways in which you can manage these, these data points and also you can restrict and target only those individuals for which you can use have certain data rights to. So the first is um, you, you have a universal approach to data management practices or geographic specific practices. And so you can segregate data practices that are going uh, with regards to your individual tactful approach to the California market. One of the ways is to either set it up utilizing geolocation or state of residence. So you can say, I want to do this type of activity everywhere except for the state of California or everywhere utilized that are outside of these IP addresses, which are common to the state of California. One of the challenges here is if you have computers that have been uh, laptops and, and other devices as such as iPads that individuals are utilizing that may have been set up. So you have a California company, you may run into a situation where those may all be geolocated back to the US and IP addresses in California versus where they may be deployed. For example, if they're, they're sent overseas or if they're sent in in throughout other states in the United States. So one of the challenges here is, is to try to capture those individuals that are in scope, but without um, going over in, in going over scope in a way that that prohibits your business from operating efficiently. So that's just one of the one of the things to, to make sure that you take a look at and, and investigate as to how when your IT department sets up 
your laptops for the, its employees, how those are um, segmented out. Are they going to all speak back to the California instance or are they going to speak out to the individual states in which the employees are doing business? Um, the other the second is to establish procedures to address the right to delete and right to opt out requirements. This is absolutely critical given the fact that this is to adhere to two of the four tenets of the uh, Privacy Act that the enforcement agencies will be focused on. You can create up automated or manual process. Obviously automated are, are preferable. Manual processes are acceptable when automated are not, not, not available, but it should be always working in that progression to have an automated process. If there's been uh, enactment as a result of GDPR, you'll see that these are similar processes as to setting up those rights for GDPR. They just now extend to the state of California. And one thing I highly recommend is to set it up so it's universal across the globe because these rights are becoming more and more uh, significant in the scope. So you have uh, the Brazil LGPD as well as other privacy regulations that are providing these rights to their citizens. So you'll see more and more of these and, and setting up a segmented targeted uh, rights for areas in scope is probably going to be more work than just creating a global approach to these. The, um, the other piece to keep in mind is that you must update and regularly review privacy policies. Um, there's a California notice of privacy practices that we utilize here at Boston Scientific that speaks to specific requirements um, outlined in the CCPA that are in addition to our standard US privacy policy. Uh, we, you must disclose in the California privacy practice how you collect information on California residents and how that collected information is used by the company. Another thing to keep in mind is that you must update the privacy policy as well as any notice to the California residents at least once every 12 months. So now we'll take a look at the future of the CCPA, which I've alluded to here by crossing that off and, and speaking more to the CPRA, which was passed again on November 3rd. This is likely to form the future of any developments in the law will likely impact any of those existing amendments for which the comment period ended in the end of October and the, is under current uh, review by the legislature as well as the Attorney General's Office of the State of California. So there might be some developments to, that might be occurring as a result of the ballot measure passing. So it's always important here to keep in mind of looking at the legislative process in the State of California and any impacts that the passage of Proposition 24 has on the actual development and updates and amendments to the CCPA. So the CC, CPRA extends B2B and employee data exemptions through January 1st, 2023. These were previously set to expire on January 1st, 2022. This is the one benefit that comes as part of the, the measure initiative from a, a corporate pr corporation perspective, where it now provides another year before these two pieces of data come in scope. However, the, you know, the other side of the argument is that it creates a lot more uh, obligations on the organization. So while there is this benefit here, the uh, amount of work effort significantly increases as a result of the new ballot measure. So the ballot measure also modifies those threshold requirements that I spoke to earlier. Um, as of January 1st, 2023, the annual gross revenue requirement will be specifically defined between January 1st and December 31st of the preceding year. This was to clear up some vague language that exists in the CCPA, where people were wondering whether or not this was on the calendar year and their fiscal year, if they could create a year. So you could say it's it's you know July 17th to J July 16th of the following year to be able to to ensure and and, and play games with whether or not you could you were covered um, and, and to to close up that gap and and, and clarify that loophole. Uh, the quantity of processing requirement does grow. So instead of being 50,000 records, it's 100,000 records. So that's also changes the threshold there. So it may exclude some companies from coming under coverage of the act as a result of that. Uh, and so it's important to understand where your quantity of processing is today, as well as where, where you plan on going in the future between now and January 1st of 2023. Uh, it also changes the annual revenue target from being the selling of information previously to now be selling and sharing personal information. So if you receive money or other compensation, so don't focus just on money, but other if you know in like in kind uh, exchanges of, of either information or uh, items of value, then this will come into into 
including sharing of information, not just not what is considered selling by by the law. It's also, and it, as it impacts Boston Scientific most significantly, the new category of sensitive personal information. So under the CCPA, there's exemptions for health information and other types of information covered by various federal laws. That now essentially it appears is going away. There's no clarity on that yet. So we, we're hoping to get clarity in the next year or two, but there will be this sensitive personal information, right? As well as additional obligations on top of the general personal information obligations that are gonna highlight these sensitive personal information. So all of your health information, which was covered by HIPAA, previously excluded, now comes into scope. And not only does it come into scope, it also comes into a more significant um, responsibility that you have for the, you know, controlling the usage and sharing of that data. There also extends to be a new right. So we had the four rights under the CPA, CPA. You now will have the right to correct information. So consumers will now have the right to add uh, if there's errors in any of the information somebody has on file to them, similar to the GDPR, they have the right to uh, ask the individual companies that are holding their personal information to correct that information uh, should there be an error. And then the uh, final piece I'll talk about here is that uh, the new enforcement agency that's being created. So under the CPRA, the California Privacy Protection Agency, also known as Cal PPPA, uh, will be the new enforcement agency. And this is a change from the Attorney General's Office, which is the current enforcement agency. And the anticipated expectation of this is that because it has its, its own agency that is not focused on other matters, it will not be sent in a queue that other matters might be prioritized versus privacy protection. And so just similar to how Europe functioned after the GDPR with your DPAs and your data protection authorities, we should expect to start seeing this in California it's likely that their funding will probably be partially based on, on fines and revenues it receives as part of its enforcement actions. Um, that's still to be to be cl you know clarified um, since the the proposition uh, doesn't call into its in specific specificity, um, but there'll be more information coming on this in the future, but it's something to be cognizantly aware of and that we expect enforcement actions in starting in 2023 to be significantly more uh, robust than they are currently. So with that, I wanna thank you for your time and for your attention to, to and hopefully that found that you um, learned a great deal regarding where the CCPA is today, where it's going tomorrow, and how the CPRA ballot initiative impacts the CCPA and your framework for your compliance measures within your company. Uh, feel free to reach out to me at any time if should you have any questions. With my email is listed here, as well as if you have any interest in benchmarking or networking opportunities to determine how other companies might be handling their CCPA or other privacy compliance framework. And that I thank you for your time and wish you a good rest of the afternoon. Um, good morning. My name is Shannon Clark. I am the Global Director and Assistant uh, General Counsel for Data Protection and Privacy at. Uh, CBRE Group. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with CBRE Group, we are the world's largest commercial real estate services and investment firm. Um, and it's a pleasure to be invited today to speak on the CCPA. Um, I'd like to preface my remarks with the caveat that my comments during this conference are not my own, are, are my own opinions and not those of my employer. So the topics I'm uh, going to be speaking on today are CCPA, Opportunity or Nightmare, and building a privacy program that addresses uh, global data protection laws. Uh, so the first question, CCPA, Opportunity or Nightmare, I think the answer depends, in my view, on one's perspective on individual privacy, um, what the value is to an individual and to society at large, um, as well as the nature of one's business, particularly for those businesses um, whose business model is based on monetizing personal data. Um, and while some have described uh, CCPA as impeding innovation and actually harming consumers by limiting their ability to receive personalized goods and service, I think there's a, a more compelling argument um, that privacy-respectful business practices increase uh, 
uh, customer trust and increased customer trust results in better business outcomes. So we see companies like Apple who are positioning their brand as a more privacy respectful option in the marketplace um, and with features like Safari's uh, intelligent tracking prevention that allows Safari to block third-party tracking of individuals' browsing habits. Um, and I think Apple's approach to privacy is really a wise uh, a business strategy. Um, so is there any data to support um, my opinion that uh, CCPA is an opportunity? Well, if you look at companies uh, like Ethisphere, who award um, a, a select group of companies um, and designate them as the world's most ethical companies, their research has shown that um, over the previous five years, um, those who've been awarded world's most ethical companies have outperformed their large cap sector competitors by 13.5%. Um, in addition, there was a study published in 2018 by Salesforce Research um, entitled Trends in Customer Report. This was a double-blind study with uh, 6,700 responses globally. Um, and the results of the study showed that 59% of customers believed their personal information is vulnerable to a security breach, and 54% don't believe that companies have their best interests in mind. And as a result, uh, Salesforce concluded that fostering trust uh, is a new business uh, imperative. Um, the study by Salesforce also concluded that transparency is crucial for building trust. And without trust, um, the individuals uh, are whose personal data uh, businesses want to use uh, for their own innovation and business growth are unlikely to disclose that personal information. Um, and interestingly, 91% of millennials and Gen Zers uh, responded to the survey that they're more likely to disclose their personal in information to companies that they trust um, and that are transparent and around uh, about how they're using the personal information that they collect. In my own experience, um, when we have sent out uh, voluntary surveys, we get a higher rate of response when we, the survey is accompanied with a transparent privacy notice that shows how we are uh, ethically and transparently using their data. Um, finally, I think it's noteworthy that over 95% of the respondents to this survey um, stated that they're more likely to be loyal to a company that they trust. So in my view, I think there is uh, empirical evidence to support the position that for those companies that are willing to engage in more privacy respectful business practices, uh, the CCPA is more opportunity than nightmare. Uh, so on to the second topic, building a privacy program that addresses global data protection laws. And so many companies around the world, and in particular U.S. multinationals, uh, really didn't put their privacy programs into high gear until they were required to comply with the GDPR, uh, which went into effect in 2018. Um, and as we were all heading into G GDPR, I think there was a belief at the time, um, at least in the uh, consultants that I spoke to, uh, that GDPR was going to be able to be used as a global framework and the 80-20 solution uh, for all global data privacy laws. I think now, um, at least in talking to my peers and in doing benchmarking, that there's a general consensus that uh, after putting this theory into practice, um, that while the GDPR can be leveraged as a global framework, there's a lot more tailoring that needs to be done to address unique jurisdictional requirements than initially anticipated. So the approach uh, that can be taken and, and how to leverage the GDPR is to start, um, and this is what we did with CCPA, for example, is to start by identifying 
points of commonality between the two laws um, and assess where the GDPR program that you already have in, in existence can be leveraged. Um, and also looking for points of divergence. Uh, when we were uh, preparing our CCPA compliance program, we also looked at how uh, we adapted GDPR for the APAC region um, and, and followed a similar approach. Um, we also had to determine uh, where we would use the GDPR as a higher standard. So for example, we have in existence a uh, data subject uh, rights response framework uh, that's built around a 30-day response time. Um, so we found it um, very easy to comply with that for CCPA um, and, and to really aim for a 30-day rather than a 45-day response time. We've also looked at um, leveraging the GDPR program and framework uh, in areas where the CCPA is silent, but because it's a good uh, privacy practice. So for example, documenting uh, uh, privacy impact assessments and incorporating uh, privacy by design into the CCPA program. Um, Looking at, at this a little more closely, one of the areas where we've really been able to leverage a global GDPR program is around change management. Um, and we looked at um, or recognized that uh, employees would not be able to re remember every um, uh, principle that's required. So we looked at the four main uh, uh, pillars that we wanted everybody, every employee to uh, remember. And we've used this throughout change management to uh, reinforce these four uh, pillars over and over again. Um, we've also been, as I mentioned, very successful in the individual rights processing, uh, leveraging our GDPR program and privacy by design. And then finally, um, data incident management, relying on one global framework in terms of how a, uh, a data incident is assessed, investigated, remediated, and then the decision to report or not. Um, data governance as well is a, is a good area to have a global program, uh, mapping and inventorying your data, um, and, and doing a lot of change management around good data hygiene. And then finally, data security is also an area where a, a one global program is, uh, I think, a best practice. Um, so that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you for your time and your attention, and I hope you've uh, found something in my remarks today that are helpful.